Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for Friday, August 3rd, 2018. Since 1990, this program has been a weekly hour of spontaneous and unrehearsed commentary on the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on a so-called community radio station and now by way of the good folks at Urbana Public Television and YouTube. Earlier editions of this program can be found on archive.org. Our name, News from Neptune, comes from Noam Chomsky, who says that in the U.S. media, either re you repeat the same conventional doctrines everyone is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. Tonight, David Green and I will try to say some true things. This is a feminism under capitalism edition of News from Neptune, and several other major topics are coming up from you David. You didn't warn me about that one. No, I didn't. That's true. Uh, I didn't study up on my well, Kate. Then I'll, I'll, my Kate. I would have studied up on my Kate, Kate Millett, but that's, well, that's okay. Well, that's, that would be appropriate. I'll, I've got a paragraph or two uh, okay. to you know, on that subject, and then we can move on to yours if you want. Yeah. Uh, the, the paragraph is brought up by a um, note from a friend of mine uh, who writes also for Counterpunch, uh, Luciana Bona. Uh, and uh, she wrote this week uh, a short, sharp uh, shock to uh, feminism under capitalism that I thought was worth mentioning. Uh, Luciana writes, keep it simple is propaganda's number one rule. So we have these women in the 1970s asking for equal pay, maternity leave, remuneration for housework, and pensions and childbearing. Uh, the movement wages for housework uh, started in the, uh, where I was teaching at the time in the 70s and uh, rings, it lives in my memory. Um, we have uh, these women in the 70s asking for, a, for these things, uh, equal pay, maternity leave, remuneration for housework, and pensions and child rear, for how, pensions and child rearing, child benefits, free child care. All this cuts into profits. So let's get them to switch focus from the body politics to plain bodies, fixate them on the body, pleasure and violence. The result she says, was post-feminism. In capitalism, especially neoliberal capitalism, the body, like everything else, nature for example, is a marketable asset, something one invests in. Detach feminists from their focus on the economic, social, and political, restrict it to the personal and the individual. Mission accomplished in the 1980s, the backlash, posing as sexual liberation. But of course, if you get women to demand freedom for their bodies, the state no longer matters. The state is not the problem. So who is? Men. Thus women no longer challenge the state. Mission accomplished, target deflected, women blame men, divide and conquer. So now there is a backlash to that division, further dividing the men-women dichotomy. What is it? Menism. That is to say, women who oppose women who blame men for their sexual victimhood. As I said, rule number one of propaganda is simplicity. Women resent men, men resent women. They cannot bother the state anymore. They're too busy fighting each other. Here we have an example. She quotes an article by, uh, from The Guardian by uh, Christina Hoff Summers, who's advertised as the feminist who is sticking up for men. Here we have an example, a member of the American Enterprise think tank, a neocon body, that's important. She takes Andrea Dworkin, uh, Hoff Summers does, takes Andrea Dworkin, who represented an essentialist version of feminism called radical feminism at one point. This essentialism simply inverted the older patriarchal paradigm, men-women, in which women were the subjected lesser part of the dualism and made it women-men, a paradigm of subjection. Somehow matriarchal societies would be better because women by nature are genetically morally superior to men. You can't be more unscientific than that, this, but millions bought it. It's simple, you see. Sexism is no longer a category that benefits capitalism. 
Sexism is no longer like racism, a strategy of profit and exploitation. No, capitalism gets off scot-free. Dworkin represented only a branch of feminist theory, but this author, Hoff Summers, presents it as feminism to court. Straw man argument, I'd say, close quote. Uh, hence, uh, that was the uh, comment, uh, uh, concentrated, but I think quite accurate, uh, from Luciana Bones. What happens when you switch uh, from class to identity as the uh, source of uh, social problems? Uh, that is the great question that was posed in the 1970s by the rise of identity politics uh, as a way to defend uh, the reassertion of the class politics, which had been in part challenged by degeneration from the New Deal to the 1970s. Uh, if class wasn't the problem, uh, then you could um, go talk about things that uh, actually did uh, uh, affect people's lives, like discrimination. Uh, you've given up on finding the real source of the problems in society, that is, uh, the history, the fact that the history of all hitherto existing societies has been a history of class struggles. The insightful note from uh, Professor Bone exposes a paramount example of identity politics. Substitute identity for class as the object of left concern, attack discrimination rather than exploitation, and the 1% needn't worry. Thomas Pynchon said if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about answers. And the question uh, being raised here uh, is whether uh, that uh, diversion has taken place. Walter Ben Michaels, uh, who has written on these matters for a while, I think very well, spells out the difference between discrimination, which identity politics attacks, and exploitation, which class politics attacks. He writes, I quote, the defensible heart of identity politics is its commitment to opposing forms of discrimination like racism, sexism, and homophobia. I share that commitment. But opposing discrimination today has no more to do with a left politics than do equally powerful ethical commitments against, say, violence or dishonesty. Why? Because the core of a left politics is its critique of and resistance to capitalism its commitment to decommodifying education, health care, and housing, and creating a more economically equal society. Decommodifying is a term that we need and um, uh, is not as familiar as it should be. To de 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 decommodify something is to take it out of the structure of buying and selling. Uh, if education is a matter of buying and selling, as if you've just paid tuition, you may know, uh, then uh, something else is going on. Health care is a matter of buying and selling. You make money by treating sick people. Health care is not something a, a uh, society provides for its members because they need it. It's something that they sell to their members. How, housing. People need food, clothing, and shelter. But if we can commodify it, if we can make it something that people have to bring money to get, uh, we have established a comfortable capitalist system. Neither hostility nor to discrimination, nor the accompanying enthusiasm for diversity, diversity meaning having uh, some members of other groups uh, included, makes the slightest contribution to accomplishing any of these goals, any of this decommodifying. Just the opposite, in fact. They function instead to provide inequality with a meritocratic justification. If everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed, that is, to get food, clothing, and shelter, there's no injustice when some people fail. This is why some of us have been arguing that identity politics is not an alternative to class politics, but a form of it. It's the politics of an upper class that has no problem with seeing people being left behind in the race for food, clothing, and shelter, as long as they haven't been left behind because of their race or sex. 
That's why elite institutions like universities make an effort to recruit black people, as well as white, into the ruling class. They're seeking to legitimate the class structure, not abolish it. Of course, if we're going to accept a ruling class, one that's open to people other than straight white men is preferable. But shouldn't the left be more committed to doing something for the vast majority of people of all races, genders, and sexual orientations who will never belong to that class? We've never thought the fact that a few white people get to become rich was a victory for poor white people. So why should substituting in a few black people change the equation? It's not racism that creates the difference between classes. It's capitalism. And it's not anti-racism that can combat the difference. It's socialism. We're frequently told that black poverty is worse than white poverty, more isolating, more concentrated, and maybe that's true. But why politically should it matter? You don't build the left by figuring out which victim has been most victimized. You build it by organizing all the victims. When it comes to the value of universal health care, for example, we don't need to worry for a second about whether the black descendants of slaves are worse off than the white descendants of coal miners. The goal is not to make sure that black people are no sicker than white people. It's to make everybody healthy. That's why they call it universal. You don't build a left by arguing over who has been most victimized. You build it by organizing all the victims. Discrimination is neoliberalism's theory of inequality. Even poor whites have started to buy it. A large number appear to think anti-white bias is their real problem. Obviously, they're wrong. But when, as Barbara and Karen Fields point out, the language of victimization has become so impoverished that it consists of nothing but discrimination, you go with what you got. A new left politics will need to change that. Instead of a more complicated understanding of identity, of race, sex, and intersectionality, that opiate of the professional managerial class, we need a more profound understanding of exploitation. I think this is a succinct and insightful account of what we're dealing with when we talk about identity politics. And it's important to see that it's not just something that happened like the rising of the moon. Uh, identity politics was uh, precisely a cover for the turning away from issues of class and exploitation by American liberalism in the 1970s. Uh, having a bad conscience about giving up on the people who are injured by our society most severely, uh, liberals looked around for other injured groups that they might be nice to, or that they might support, or they might uh, uh, get some members of uh, jobs. Uh, this, out of this comes identity politics. And of course, it's not the case that those who attack identity politics are in favor of the discriminations that identity politics opposes. It just means that a category mistake has been made. They've missed the point. They've, seen, they've suggested that the reason that, uh, the, uh, uh, that people suffer in our society from the structure of society is primarily a matter of discrimination. It's not. It's exploitation. It's not uh, identity. It's capitalism. Uh, so. There's a, a standard <laughs> yeah. rap 101. I, I told you before the program that I had three rants. And okay. One of those rants, not the first one I'm going to do, but I'll refer to it, okay. is directly related to that. That Great. had to do with a speech that former former President, President Obama gave the Mandela lecture in uh, South yes. Africa, which was critiqued on the Real News Network by uh, Paul Jay interviewing Leo Panitch, the political scientist. So... But, and we'll, we'll see how that relates to okay. that. But I wanted to get this out of the way first. Okay. Because um, that's kind of, in, in, the, in the moment, it's got me the most sort of worked up. Although, let me footnote one thing. The Jacobin uh, website has a, 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 a link this week or in the last few days or a couple of days to an article or to a long uh, thesis by Bar Barbara Ehrenreich, 
whose work goes back to the 1970s, if not sooner. And she, she articulated a, a feminist understanding, a socialist feminist understanding. Um, that's quite long. Um, I mean, not, not book, not, you know, not academic article long, but close to it, I think. But there's a link to that on the Jacobin website, because I think there, in the context of the post-Bernie Sanders, uh, you know, issues, the whole democratic socialist issues, people are going back and reading some of these things. And Barbara Ehrenreich is somebody who's always had both cogent and sort of prescient uh, understandings of things for the last now 40 years or so, or, or longer. Um, but what I wanted to get off my chest here <clears throat> has to do with what faced me in the headline of the New News, News Gazette this morning. <laughs> um, uh, on, the, on the front page, the right side of the front page, um, and the first paragraph or so, first couple of paragraphs, go something like, like this. As dozens of police detectives sat behind computers Thursday in Urbana while learning the best ways to intercept child, por child, child pornography peddlers and us users, a retired federal agent who specialized in that for 25 years was a around the corner announcing a $100,000 donation to help law enforcement in Illinois with that work. Quote, our mission is to save children from sex trafficking internationally and in the U.S., said John Lines, operations president for Operation Underground Railroad. You, they have a website you can go to. It's estimated that 40 million people worldwide, half of them children, are victims of sex trafficking, Lines said. What used to happen on dark street corners and brothels is now happening online, end quote, Lines said, of the sophisticated network of child sex trafficking where most of the abused are victimized by, quote, Western American males, end quote. The nonprofit group funded by donations teams up with law enforcement to find where those child victims are using former Navy SEALs, CIA agents, and special ops operatives, they arrange and carry out rescue missions, then work to reintegrate those victims into society, wherever they are. The Salt Lake City-based organization has 14 full-time paid staff members. And the article goes on. Uh, at some length after that. And I wanted to raise this issue in a couple of contexts. One is, one thing I always admired, as you know, Carl, about Alexander Coburn is he mm -hmm. was willing to take on difficult issues, especially in relation to moral panics, and so especially in relation to issues that related to moral panics. And, and I... Uh, in terms of the child daycare so-called scandals right. of the 1980s right. in relation, and I, and in relation to the liberal anti-hate groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center yes. and the Anti-Defamation -Def League. Uh, and um, if he were still alive, I think he would be all over the issue of the manner in which uh, so-called rape culture is being adjudicated on college campuses this this week, uh, something which uh, I think was was ruled on recently in a in a in a issue related to this to this campus, um, and along with the child the moral panic uh, again not to deny that child sex trafficking is a real problem or child pornography is a real problem. The question is, how is it becoming a political problem? Who's promoting it to become a political problem? And how is it that former Navy SEALs, CIA agents, and special ops operatives are seemingly operating outside the law to arrest people? This is a moral panic, I think or this has all the earmarkings of a moral panic. 
the legislation that has been passed at the federal level and at the there's leg, the the legislation that has been passed at the federal level there's a house version and a senate version of that has been which which outlaws um, sexual advertising online has been criticized by those who I think rightfully are defending sex workers who uh, had developed online advertising in order to make their work more safe. And those who are defending, who I think are rightfully, and this is obviously a controversial issue, are rightfully defending the safety of sex wor workers, both from the police and their need to have pimps, um, have used online outlets to function. And this is making the, this legislation is called, uh, there's one called HOSTA and one called SOSTA, the H stands for House, the S stands for Senate Online Sex Trafficking Acts, has uh, become under much criticism uh, from those who feel that they are defending the safety of sex workers. And this needs to be talked about. This does not, not need to be put under the carpet. Um, I'm, the, the, um, the ma the so the manner in which this this again which this this moral panic over child sex trafficking in this vague way you can get a sense of that if you go to this uh, Operation uh, Underground Railroad or whatever it's called website oh. mm -hmm. and uh, yeah Operation Underground Railroad I just finished reading the book the Underground Railroad the novel the Underground Railroad but that's well, about something else about something else <laughs> but but any any anyway. Um, so I'm just alerting people to the idea that there is more going on here. And when you see that CIA operatives are involved, this you know there's more going on here. And when you see um, uh, uh, our state senator Scott Bennett trumpeting, since he has no accomplishments in the state legislature of, of any value, maybe that's not his fault. But when he trumpets himself for um, for promoting some bill to um, to get rid of the stat statute of, of li limitations in the in the post Denny Hastert era, you know that that's grandstanding because sex trafficking and sex crimes and so forth is always fodder for politicians who have accomplished nothing else. They always know that they can push that button if they have to. If you mind me being so so bold as to say so, um, and 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 so. There is a lot going on here, and what's not being considered, what's being talked about in some quarters, is um, the rea again the issue of what we criminalize and what we don't criminalize. And sex work, of course, has been criminalized, but there's more and more people saying that it shouldn't be. And the idea that that you have you have former military people and former CIA people right. operating in the shadow the shadowy world. Uh, I know I have no doubt. I don't think that the shadow, shadowy world of sex trafficking and child prostitution and child 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 pornography exists, but they I I doubt that they're going about it in a way in the most effective way in the larger context to deal with these things. And the political political antenna should should be raised when we read an article like this. In our in our morning paper, which has no, of course, no critique. This is a, a kind of feature article. It's a kind of puff piece. Maybe those seals and CIA people are in that group that didn't get nominated by the local Democratic Party to run for Congress, and therefore are looking for work, right? Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know if I'd go that far, but yes. <laughs> there was a big movement to get yeah. seals and, uh, yeah, well, and CIA and special yeah. forces people uh, to run for Congress locally. We had oh, an example oh, here in, in, in Illinois 13, yeah. and it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a happen it wasn't a matter of happenstance. Yeah. I mean, it was a conscious, calculated uh, program mm -hmm. by the Democrat. By by the Democrats yeah. who have very reasonable uh, fears of losing their uh, yeah. uh, the, the, their mojo in yeah. running for Congress. And just one more thing, perhaps. Sure. Just, just again, the question needs to be asked when you look around the world and you look at, at problems, various problems that, uh, let's call them do-gooders, I don't think or want to deal with. Um, we, we rarely ask what the role of the United States foreign policy might have in creating the circumstances which generate child sex trafficking. 
the uh, uh, issues of free speech, of course, are very much involved here. Uh, the uh, present move that we see in this country to make sure that social media and so forth are, are properly censored so that people don't get fake news and bad ideas uh, from the uh, uh, from uh, social media, uh, this unfortunately is given a boost by this sort of concern. There are real problems out there, as there are in general. Uh, but the idea that uh, by if we can prevent people from talking about it or saying anything about it, we've somehow made progress is usually a mistake, I think. So again, just to read a couple of other things from this article, um, lines this guy's being interviewed said his his or, or organization which is a private a privately funded thing said his his or, or organization is working to support law enforcement in 17 states in the United States as well as Thailand Mexico Colum Colombia Uganda and in India to name a few other countries we are not and he's quoted we are not some backup vigilantes we go in through the front door <laughs> In countries like Thailand, Mexico, Colombia, Uganda, and India, that's a little discordant <laughs> in countries in which you have organized crime and governments that cooperate mm. with organized crime, mm. uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, it's all very, very fishy. And, of course, it's hard to critique it because you don't know what the base reality that they're trying to right. deal with is. And But there's... There's a lot going on here. It's not being dealt with in a straightforward way, and other people's political, other political agendas are being served, including just taking the subject off the usual things that we talk about on this program, you know, poverty and yeah. war and stuff, climate change, stuff like that. You're watching News from Neptune, uh, and we are illustrating once again the old SDS maxim that everything is connected. Uh, what's your next connected step? Well, let me, let me just read, well, again, to go on here and get to get back to your you know, initial points. Um, just a couple of snippets from the conversation that, uh, that Paul Jay had with um, Leo Panitch uh -huh. regarding Barack Obama's Mandela lecture, okay. uh, which the transcript, of course, and the video is available online. But the, the sort of the money, the money paragraph of Obama in terms of the betrayal of Obama and the whole, the whole con, uh, they, they played a clip uh, of, of this speech, of Obama's speech, that goes that, in which he said the following things. I won't try to do Obama, although I'm tempted to. I'm getting pretty good at it. Um, but, but we can learn from the last 70 years that it will not involve unregulated, unbridled, unethical capitalism. It also won't involve old-style command and control socialism. Again, bad over here, bad over yeah. here, from, from the, the top. That was tried, according to Obama. Again, that was tried, like in the Soviet Union, of course. It didn't work. Uh, that was tried. It didn't work very well, Obama says. For almost all countries, progress is going to depend on an inclusive market-based system. Just hit all the right notes, hit all the identity yeah. politics notes. Inclusive. One that, one that offers education for every child, that protects collective bargaining and secures the rights of every worker, that breaks, breaks up, breaks up mon you know, mon monopolies to encourage competition in small, medium-sized businesses. You know, you know, a lot of that breaking up happened during o Obama's eight years. I must have missed it. Yes. Um, and has laws that root, root, out, root, out, root, root out corruption and ensures fair dealing in, in business. That maintains some form of progressive taxation so that rich people are, again, and here's where it gets to the nub of it, Obama's liberal, neoliberal philosophy, so that rich people are still rich, but they're giving a little bit back to make sure that everybody has something to pay for universal health care and retirement security and invest in infrastructure and scientific research that builds platforms for inno innovation. It involves promoting an inclusive capitalism, both within nations and between nations. Uh, again, lots of pretty words. Uh, and... and um, and, and so Paul Jay comments, so this seems to be the nub of the problem with President Obama. The rich, and one should say the super rich, can still be rich and super rich. And if only they give up a little, everything will be, will be okay. And then Leo Panitch is the, uh, the author of The Making of Global Capitalism, the Canadian uh, political scientist, says, 
You know, I keep referring to these guys as prag pragmatists, and it's true, they are. That's what drives them. They're pragmatic, unlike me and you, he's talking to Paul J., who are indeed idealists. That said, you listen to those words and you think about President Obama, what, what, a, what a romantic, what an idealist. You cannot have what he's talking, and Panitch asserts, you cannot have what he's talking about within capitalism. The room for reform within the system as it's evolved does not allow for that anymore. That is what one needs to learn. And we've seen the failure not only of his, but of Blair's and the third way politics, of Schroeder's, etc., of a whole range of them who said, we can have all these things while riding with the wind of global competition and uh, accumulation. And that's simply proven not to be the case, Panitch argues. And much of his speech makes that case. So for him to then turn around and say, in other words, much of Obama's previous speech made the case that this isn't working anymore. And much, so for him then to turn around and say, well, we want to have all these things within an inclusive capitalism, there's no grounds for it. He's standing on no ground. And in that sense, I think that, that he points to how this has all evolved in such an ugly way. In my view, this actually helps make the case for the socialist left. Moreover, insofar as he says we've tried top-down socialism and it doesn't work, that leaves space to say, well, we haven't tried bottom-up socialism. We haven't tried social, social, social democracy. But we haven't, we haven't tried democratic socialism. We've tried authoritarian communism, but we haven't tried democratic socialism. And the first thing we need to do in democratic socialism is turn the financial system into a public utility. The second thing we need to do is fundamentally transform the institutions of the state so that they aren't organized and structured so as to reproduce private property and reproduce the power of the very people that he says are the greedy bastards they, they, you know, they are. So, uh, just one more paragraph. So I think, Panitch says, one can do something with this. And I think, you know, we were saying this off camera as well. His rhetoric in the run-up to the 2008 election and then the, the disappointment that it was already felt by 2010 is what I think contributed to creating Occupy. And what created Occupy, since Occupy with its anarchistic impulses meant that you could protest forever but not change the world, quickly led the bridge was very short, quickly led to the to the candidacy of a democratic socialist within the Democratic Party that almost turned American politics on its ears and as much as Trump as the Trump one did. So we can debate about what he means, how he's mm -hmm. interpreting the Sanders movement there, but that, at least it puts it on the, the table. And that, I think the motivations yeah. that he's talking about, the background or what what brought Sanders to the fore as well yes. about Trump are, are absolutely right, of course. That's the question. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's quite right. Um, given the uh, uh, account of what Obama was saying in this lecture, we should perhaps pay some attention to what Obama has done recently, too. I have in mind particularly a list of endorsements that he put out this last week. He endorsed Democratic candidates across the country, uh, candidates running for the House primarily, also for the Senate. But uh, the uh, endorsements uh, were predicated on the fact that we really have uh, here in East Central Illinois, uh, one vote on the federal level, only one vote for one office on the federal level for the next two and a half years. And that's the vote for the House, for the House of Representatives uh, coming up this fall, this November. And so what Obama did was give us a list of acceptable Democrats, there are only Democrats on the list, uh, who could be elected to the House and perhaps a few Senate seats uh, across the country. Um, the, uh, for our local purposes, it was interesting that he did not include uh, Dirksen Lonegren, Londrigan, the uh, Democratic nominee for the House of Representatives uh, to run against Rodney Davis in this, um, uh, in this congressional district. But he did endorse uh, a good number of others, some 50 uh, candidates across the country. And, uh, and did not endorse Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. 
in New York. And that's the point. That he made a sh if you look at the list of those he endorsed and those he didn't, mm -hmm. what you see is a sketch of this bifurcation that's taken place in the Democratic Party between the Sanders wing, if you like, uh, and the Orthodox wing. Uh, the uh, uh, the Hillary Clinton wing and so forth, uh, and it's clear he takes that seriously, and it's clear he comes down on one side of it. But there are plenty of people who are saying, look, the Democrats are going to reform themselves after this uh, unfortunate presidential election, and the sorts of critiques that were coming from Bernie Sanders uh, and his supporters will be incorporated into a new revived Democratic Party. Nothing of, could be further from the truth uh, from uh, the evidence of Obama's list. Yeah, it's confusing to me what his motives were doing yeah. and what his, what his goal is. I mean, you, one would simply assume this isn't a, a not endorsement. One would assume Obama wants people to vote Democratic in every, in every House race. So the question is, what is he doing by 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 choosing this list of fifty or sixty, whatever, well, whatever it was? Is he asking for people? These are the people that need money, money the most. No, or the pe yeah. these are the people who are not associated with the Sanders wing. Okay. This is a uh, this is open warfare within the Democratic Party, which the Democratic Party has been uh, uh, has been doing. I mean, look at the concerns for the. Uh, 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 party leaders, uh, uh, Perez and so forth, uh, that have uh, emerged in, since the election. Uh, there's a real issue there. I mean, and those folks who are saying, well, of course, Sanders' criticisms can be incorporated into the Democratic Party and we'll all get along, are rejected primarily by the organizational Democrats, such as the uh, people that Obama has endorsed here, and Obama is on their side. Okay. Well, here we go. P uh, Paul Jay, in this same interview that he did b b prior to the to the section I just read, Paul Jay talking about about you know, Obama, um, and he's and he says and he's very much involved in actively managing, as I was saying off camera. I've been told by many people who know the story that when Perez was fighting with Keith Ellison to for be, for being head of the DNC, Obama was actively working the phones to defeat Keith Ellison. Did not he did not want the progressive candidate to be the head of the DNC? Right. So he's he's not just out there as you know and and, and all that he's he's in the pits fighting. And exactly. Thomas Frank, the author who did the you know the well known author is the critique of the liberal democrat neoliberal democratic party, he made an interesting comment in one of our interviews where he says you need to understand the corporate demo. Democrats don't dislike the left of the party. They hate the left there of the we party. Go. And this is because this is a class contradiction. It's just not a it's just not some difference of opinion. This 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 couldn't be clearer. And as I say, uh, Obama has enacted it this week with his uh, with his endorsements. That yeah. seems to, be ex to me exactly right. Yeah. So, so where are we? Uh, are are we? Where where is where is where is poor Betsy DL? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, trying to decide on what her name is, apparently. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things. Um, <laughs> you're watching uh, uh, News from Neptune. We're trying to talk about the sorts of things that are going on in this uh, uh, remarkable uh, election season, which we have to see is open now with these uh, sorts of uh, uh, raids on the inarticulate by uh, uh, Barack Obama. Um, and uh, that leads me to... Uh, the article we were talking about before we went on the air, uh -huh. then I'd like to say something okay. about, or maybe you want to no, go no, to another matter no, first. No, huh? Why don't you, why don't you do that? You, uh, my, my throat's getting sore. <laughs> this is, this is an article by Rob Urey, who yeah. writes for the Counterpunch yeah. website, which we often quote here, uh, not always in a complete agreement by any means, in fact. Uh, I mean, with, with the whole website, not necessarily with Rob Urey, who I don't think we ever really. No, that's true. Yeah, right, I mean, yeah. Urey is one of the writers for this site Uri. that is all, always, as a matter of fact, uh, which has always been Catholic in its taste, yeah. and I very uh, yeah. pointedly insist on the lowercase c, it's Catholic in the sense that it, it uh, uh, publishes a variety of left and liberal viewpoints, uh, and even some that some people would call conservative or paleoconservative. Uh, not a lot of neoconservatives, I think, on, on Counterpunch, but on the range of political opinion uh, includes uh, uh, conflicting ideas of a number of, so of, a number of sorts. Um, 
and uh, ideas which the editors do not themselves always agree with. Uh, both in, of us, you know, in, you know, in, you know in, including um, the uh, more a more cynical attitude towards the rising social democratic forces within the Democratic Party, or at least within the electoral functions of the Democratic Party. Some highly critical of uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and so forth. That of course you wouldn't find on Jacobin, which is the movement, which is that movement, mm. which doesn't really criticize, as far as I know, is it, I mean, talks about the nature of party politics and the, and the pitfalls of party politics, but wouldn't publish some of the kind of articles that you have on Counterpunch, which just, which just dismiss the notion that we can work within the Democratic Party. Um, the uh Account of uh, Donald Trump and the American left offered in an article posted mm -hmm. this morning on that website uh, concludes as follows. The best case scenario looking forward is that Donald Trump is successful with rapprochement toward North Korea and Russia and that he throws a monkey wrench into the architecture of neoliberalism uh, global, glo uh, corporate globalism, so that a new path forward can be built when he's gone. If he pulls it off, this isn't reactionary nationalism, and it isn't nothing. Now, uh, Uri, I think, is uh, uh, sometimes uh, defeated by the terms he uses to uh, discuss the matter, but um, uh, that seems to me not unfair prediction if we remember that by reactionary nationalism here is meant not uh, the uh, economic nationalism that Trump uh, ran on, that is uh, the restoration of the economic fortunes of the majority of Americans. So that's what he meant by economic nationalism. And of course the Democrats quickly turned that over into, a, uh, 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 into racism. Uh, when Trump says economic nationalism, said Hillary Clinton, what he means is uh, being, being bad to black people. Uh, now, given the existence of racism amongst Trump's followers, and perhaps Trump himself, uh, which may be the, le the least important aspect of the question, um, there is some truth in that, but we, I think we have to understand that the economic nationalism that elected Donald Trump was a reassertion of the uh, economic interest of the majority of the uh, uh, community, the majority of the American electorate, that had been ignored for more than a generation by the rise of neoliberalism the reassertion of, re, re of a stringent capitalism that has characterized American politics since uh, um, uh, the post-60s era and that the Democrats have been in the forefront of. Uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign was based on that sort of economic, that, is, that sort of neoliberalism. Uh, and Trump won in part because he was the first American candidate from a major party to challenge neoliberalism and neoconservatism in 40 years. Now, until that discussion becomes clearer and avoids the attempt by the Democrats completely to misrepresent what's going on, I think we'll have trouble understanding what happened in this last election and also uh, trouble understanding what the possibilities are uh, for, the, for Trump and the left, as Rob Burry describes in this article. Yeah, but when you look at this, uh, at the allegedly anti-neoliberal aspect of Trump's policies, meaning, meaning domestic policies and trade policies, uh, you know, you 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 run into many more problems than yes. one looks looks at foreign policy right. in relation to to you know, Korea, North Korea, or or Russia, and so forth. Because there's just nothing in terms of the reality of the working class in this country. Um, this this tariff policy, this seeing, uh, you know, I, I I shouldn't talk about what I follow not all that much, but. It's smoke, smoke, smoke and mirrors pretty much in, in terms of, of doing something that's actually putting 
putting us on a path towards having an economic nationalism that that makes sense and could be proud of if if that's if that's where he's going uh just this you, the, and all the all the this blizzard of tariffs and back and forth doesn't help us to understand any better how our economy works and what's wrong with it. I mean, I don't think tariffs was is not the the way to even look at or understand what's going on in the world. It's much more in relation to uh, to to as Dean Baker often talks about patents and copyrights and all that global 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 investor rights and and all this kind of. This this kind of stuff. So, um, uh, I think so. It just. I mean, Trump isn't. He isn't helping anybody out. I mean, he isn't helping anybody mm. out with his tax cuts. He isn't helping anybody out with the with the, the tariff business. Um, with this helping uh, some rich people, maybe. Yeah, helping some rich with this idea of lowering the you know this this finagling with the the tax on capital gains right. to get, exactly. put another hundred billion. Even though the the the, the press. Is dishonest in the way it covers these things because it covers these things so, because it's a hundred billion dollars over over ten years. Not that it's not chump change, <laughs> but it's ten billion dollars yeah. per year to the to the richest ten percent or one percent or whatever. That's bad. That's horrible. But a hundred billion dollars serves the interests of people who want to scare people into thinking that Trump is doing horrible things. And this is this is blatant. This is awful. But it's not central. It's not helping our understanding of how the economy is actually working and why the how this data about jobs is, and stuff, what really, what it really means for average people. It's all this blizzard. And I think Trump likes all this. Trump, Trump is just keeping things stirred up without really doing anything while helping his rich friends. As a uh, Illinois politician who was also named Dirksen uh, said at one point, a billion here, a billion there. Before yeah. long, you're yeah. talking real money. But that was in the days at least when a billion, a billion meant something. something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. When uh, uh, trillion dollar corporations are around, why yeah, billions yeah. become uh, yeah, uh, yeah. ever yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh Let me try Rob Urie's thing and see if it makes more, more sense to you than it did to me. Okay. The election of Donald Trump fractured the American left. Is that true? Um, that's that's his that's his uh, I think lead. It was already line. fractured. Yeah. Yeah. And, exactly. That's yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah. The abandonment of class analysis. In response to Mr. Trump's racial, racialized nationalism, left identity politics to fill the, the void. There's some truth in this, but as I suggested a few minutes ago, I think it happened uh, 40 years ago. Uh, the abandonment of class analysis by American liberals happened in the 1970s. Yeah. Uh, we can point to particular examples. Um, it was not a response to Mr. Trump's racialized nationalism. In some ways, the racialized nationalism, they're taking your jobs and so forth and we're going to do something about that, was a response to the neoliberalism that uh, uh, abandoned class analysis in the 1970s. This has facilitated the rise of neoliberal nationalism, an embrace of the national security state combined with neoliberal economic analysis put forward as a liberal left response to Mr. Trump's program. I think that line is right, but takes a yeah. while to, to, to uh, uh, take apart and see what's he, being said. He, he, he assumes a lot about what people know what's going on in his head. And I do, but maybe, <laughs> you know, kind of because I read this guy, but I'll maybe. But we I should try to it. explain it. I mean, when we speak of neoliberalism here, we, jo we don't mean just sort of more liberal than uh, yeah. John Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, we don't mean uh, an extreme form of liberalism. Yeah. What we need, mean is an extreme form of capitalism. Uh, we've got to realize that uh, more than a generation of American politics from the New Deal through the 1960s was an attempt to ameliorate uh, the ravages of capitalism on the most exploited, on the American working class. Uh, that's what the New Deal reforms were about, to take the edge of capitalism when it met the ground, so to speak, in the Midwest. Uh, the uh, uh, neoliberalism was a reassertion of the rights of capital, the rights of money, the uh, attempt to destroy unions, international agreements, things like this, that actually in inhibited the exploitation that capitalism had brought. 
Uh, that's what the New Deal tried to do. Uh, that's what, in a certain heightened way, the 1960s tried to do uh, as people suddenly came to realize that America's foreign wars in the post-World War II were in defense of American capital and capitalists and not a matter of freedom and liberty for either at home or abroad. Neoliberalism uh, was a, uh, a conscious program by American business to reassert its rights over against the uh, movements to improve the lot of American workers and to mitigate the uh, ravages of capitalism as they existed from the Great Depression on. So when we speak of neoliberal nationalism, what we mean uh, is the uh, 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 something different from uh, the uh, assertion of the rights of American business, in fact, just the opposite. Uh, so that's, uh, the discussion is complex and difficult uh, from the very beginning. What had been unfocused consensus around issues of economic justice and ending militarism has been sharpened into a political program a nascent self-styled socialism movement is pushing domestic issues like single-payer health care, strengthening the social safety net, and reversing wildly unbalanced income and wealth distribution forward. Left unaddressed is how this program will move forward without a revolutionary movement to act, to act against countervailing forces. This is uh, the description of the Sanders campaign, a description against the uh, uh, DSA, a description of the program of the D Democratic Socialists of America, an attempt to try to say that the, that amelioration of, cap of capital can indeed take place um, an attempt to say that in this past generation. As widely loathed as the democratic establishment is, it has been remarkably adept at engineering a reactionary response to this movement in favor of establishment forces. Establishment forces means big money. Its demonization of Russia has been approximately as effective at fomenting reactionary nationalism as Mr. Trump's racialized version. Uh, that takes some unpacking. Let's this be overlooked. The strategy common to both is the use of oppositional logic through de demonization of carefully selected others. I, I think that yeah. really is an unfortunate and inaccurate description all the way. Yeah. Uh, and the, the uh, argument that um, Uri puts forward is that this the most potent f fracture of the left, the question of which is the more effective reactionary force, the Democrats' neoliberal nationalism, or Mr. Trump's racialized version. Come on. Uh, yeah, the, uh, what, it's important to see at the outset is that it was exactly Trump's attacks on neoliberalism, his attacks on this uh, uh, corporate globalism uh, in the name of the majority uh, that have, uh, uh, suffered uh, from uh, 40 years of neoliberalism that made him president. But there's a second step that we've got to, got to see. And the second step is that the uh, uh, attacks uh, were largely limited to the campaign. As David suggested a moment ago, w once in office, uh, Trump, for whatever reason, and the danger of psychologizing Trump here is very great, Trump, for whatever reason, adopted most of the neoliberal policies of the outgoing Obama administration. He'd also adopted some of the neoconservative policies of that, but as you suggest, here in some areas, such as uh, the relationship with North Korea and the relationship with Russia, uh, Trump uh, stuck to his guns. A terribly unimportant, a terribly un inaccurate notion, because was precisely against a critique of the guns being used for war and war provocation by the previous administration uh, that uh, formed the heart of his attack on neoconservatism. And, and, and meanwhile, Bernie Sanders is saying some shocking things about Russia and Putin that would get him on the Rachel Maddow show if, if, if she didn't dislike everything else about him.
this is this is important, and the reason is it's so difficult, I think, to uh, try to sort out what's going on in American politics right now amongst the major parties uh, because of their. Uh, uh, desperate attempt to cover their tracks, uh, their attempt to misrepresent what in fact they're doing, whom they're working for, and what they're trying to do in, in, in the interest of that. The short answer is they are trying to restore the status quo ante, the neoliberal programs uh, and the neoconservative programs of the last administration. Uh, Barack Obama was the first American president to be at war throughout two presidential terms. That had never happened before. Uh, Barack Obama, as we heard a few minutes ago from the speech that David quoted, uh, is reasserting in no uncertain terms the neoliberal concerns of 40 years of American government. That's the enemy. That's what we're against. That's what we've got to stop. And the, uh, the uh, possibility that uh, the Trump administration is the frail vessel for any of this uh, uh, material is a, a very open question, I think. Yeah. And, you know, and the question becomes on the, the left, if we can still talk about yeah, the that, left. Yeah, that's the, part of the problem. And the, yeah, but the, the you know, the, the, uh, the debate keeps going back to some of the, you know, perhaps obtuse issues we were talking about three or four weeks ago in terms of the state and the role of political parties within the state. And, you know, one can, on the one hand, one can't help but acknowledge that our two-party system is an extension of the corporate state. And it doesn't allow, just structurally, institutionally, doesn't allow uh, in every, every way that our, our voting system and our, parla our, our non-parliamentary system functions, doesn't allow for any radical change from within this party system. And so the, the, jo the job on the, the DSA left, the Jacobin left, or whatever you want to call it, is to kind of try to figure out where where these incursions can be, can be made, and there's a lot of talk about that, and I think it's I think it's intelligent talk, it's necessary talk, but at the end end of the day, the question is whether um, whether we need party politics or we need movements, and and as each day that goes by, the less enthusiastic I get about every almost any kind of electoral politics. Um, we need movements in the, in the streets, and you know that's easy to say. And um, I don't know what's going to generate the kind of movements that, as you were saying, I think on, on one of your on one of your posts, it wasn't elections that ended the Vietnam War. Right. And that's important, and that's worthwhile remembering. And we should mention here, we should really finish up here with a reference to um, the worldwide populist mood. Uh, and I think uh, to call it a mood, it's probably better than to call, than to call it a pop uh, a uh, a political movement, because what we're speaking of here is a growing conviction, not just in this country and elsewhere, that there's a fundamental contradiction between the interests of the majority, uh, the interests of the majority and the interests of the very few, of the one percent, of the economic elite, uh, and that's become clearer as the contrast, the direct material contrast, between the majority and that elite has grown over the last generation. Uh, inequality in the United States is grown rapidly and indeed at an accelerating rate over this period. It's happened elsewhere as well. And the importance of Thomas Piketty's book on capital in the 21st century is that he has identified this movement. Uh, what has not really been talked about is the way in which this movement has, produ has produced uh, political results that don't really follow along the left-right distinction that we normally use about politics. They follow along a distinction between the people and the elite. And this is the sort of thing that produces everything from the Sanders and Trump campaigns together to the Brexit vote in England to the rise of uh, Mélenchon and Le Pen in France uh, to the uh, various to the new Italian government, which came about as a result of a union of a left party and a right party in the old nomenclature uh, that throughout 
the equivalent of the Republicans and Democrats in Italy and put together a coalition uh, that seems unnatural to our political uh, pundits, but in fact represents this populist wave. It's happening, it's happening here, it's happening around the world, and uh, you'll hear more about it. Yeah. I think one, one good note that Uri strikes in his article was to d dismiss the notion that Trump was was elected by the white by the the white racist working class. I think that's you right. Know, he dismisses no. that 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 notion, and I and I, and and in in contravention to another counterpunch writer, Eric Dreitzer, who implies yeah. that in almost yeah. everything yeah. he writes and all of this. Not you could see his article there. Uh, it was I don't know it was yesterday or this this morning. Um, uh, harping on the idea of fascism, fascism, fascism. Yep. Um, that's not a proper understanding mm -hmm. of what fascism is. We could talk about fascism some other time, or we could just become fascists. But, <laughs> but we'll, we'll wait until next week. <laughs> uh, uh, this, this is important. <laughs> Uh, you've been watching news from Neptune for Friday, August 3rd. Some people probably already think we're fascists, but we'll this, there. <laughs> this has been a feminism, feminism under capitalism edition of news from Neptune that's wandered way from that, but in, from that theme, but certainly includes it. Well, Our everybody, read Barbara Ehrenreich's essay for next week, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that. There'll be a short quiz. Okay. Our program is produced and directed by Jason Liggett, Ethan Young, and Andrew Scholarly. Our thanks for research to Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson, knows notes for our family on the Facebook page for News from Neptune. Now, this is Carl Esterbrook with David Green saying, Inshallah, we'll be back next week to remind you, in the words of Edward de Vere from The Tempest, what's past is prologue, what to come in yours and my discharge. Meanwhile, confusion to our enemies, and a good night to you. <laughs>